Hi, Lindsay. Hi, Moby. Hi, Bagel. Hi, Moby. <laughs> uh, so, we have a lot of stuff we want to talk about today. A lot. Um, so, we want to talk about, I had an experience recently, which was very scary, but also, I think, very indicative of a certain cultural moment that we're having. So, we, we want to talk about that. But we're also going to do a little finish the lyric, which is something we've done a couple times that, boy, do I just love. So, we're going to do that. And then we're going to talk about your music stuff that you've got going on. And then we're going to talk about your minimalism, your anti-luxury lifestyle. Okay. Well, great. So why don't we get started? Let's put on our caps and dive right in. Okay, so I thought it would be really fun to do a little finish the lyric. Which we've done before. We've done it many times before, but it tickles me every time we do it. I think we've done it twice. Well... (laughs) <laughs> yeah, but it, it tickled me both times then. Um, this is from one of the most popular songs, maybe on planet Earth right now. Okay? N- now I'm nervous. Well, don't, because it's all for fun, and you don't listen I'm, to top 40s. No, but... So it's it's okay if I you guess don't it's, know. Okay, yeah, I guess it's... I've now admitted in public that I don't know anything. I know some names of contemporary musicians. You know I've heard, names, you have your respect, but you I, don't necessarily... It's not your on like your Bad rotation. Like Bad Bunny, that's a, that's a band. That's a, <laughs> that's a very uh, a, a rabbit that ignores all the rules. <laughs> um, it's well, like one of my favorite Thirty Rock lines is Liz Lemon. Someone has accused her of not being hip, and she's like, "I'm hip. I like bands like Amy Grant." <laughs> 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 okay, no joke. Amy Grant was like the only CD I had for about two months when I first got my compact disc portable player. Did she do the song Baby Baby? Mm-hmm. Baby, baby. That's Amy Grant. Oh, wow. Yeah. See, I knew that. Okay. See, there you so, go. Okay, so we're so gonna... you are familiar with so, more bands so, like Amy Grant. <laughs> so complete the lyric. Okay. So this is from... A popular song. A very popular song. Okay. Sweet Like Blank... Blank is a cat blanking in my lap because it loves me. Sweet like blank. Blank as a cat. Is a cat. Blank is a cat. Mm -hmm. Blank. Blanking in my lap because it loves me. Okay. Sweet like a potato. (laughs) Bagel in my lap chewing scrunchies because she loves me. I mean, I mean, granted, I'm not using any creativity because I just gave Bagel and Lucy sweet potatoes. <laughs> I'm looking at Bagel and she has a scrunchie in her mouth. So like, she, yeah, you're really just saying what you see in the room. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so you're wrong. Yeah. But I do like sweet like a potato. Yeah. I think if you haven't used that in a song of your own by now, it's the time. Sweet like a potato. There aren't enough songs about potatoes, in my opinion. There are very few. But there are a lot of songs like about honey, sweet like honey. Karma is a cat purring in my lap because it loves me. Who Who is the musician? Taylor Swift. Oh, okay. This is a song about karma. And basically, people think that it's about that guy that bought her catalog. You know what I'm talking about? That guy that bought her catalog? Yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, this is a song that pe- many people think is about that situation, talking about how, or uh, some people think it's about the Kanye situation of, you know, people that have wronged her, and it's about how karma's going to get them. Okay. Like, she calls she calls the person who wronged her a spider boy, a king of thieves, hmm. you know? My pennies made your crown, is what she says in the song. Spider so. boy. Okay. Spider boy. It's a really catchy song. I personally really love it. Yeah, I've never, I've never heard a Taylor Swift. My yoga teacher plays it in um, the yoga class all the time. Okay. Yeah. Um, anyway, that was fun, right? Yeah. Uh, and we got to talk about Taylor Swift in a way that won't incur the wrath of the Swifties, except for me admitting in public I don't think I've ever actually heard a Taylor Swift song, which That's is okay. fine because I'm an old person and I should not be listening. I mean, it'd be a little. Wouldn't it be weird if, as a man in his fifties, I knew a whole lot about Taylor Swift's music? That, I don't. I think Taylor Swift really crosses that boundary. Hmm, okay. You know? Well, I'm just being super cautious because I know I've watched what happened to people who've offended the Swifties and like they're hell hath no wrath like a Swiftie offended. 
It could not be more true. You might as well say that you hate puppies. Yeah. You know? So, okay, so we finished the lyric, hopefully in a way that won't offend Taylor Swift's 100 million angry fans. I just want to say for the record, Swifties out there, I do love Taylor, so don't come for me. So you want to talk about anger. I do. Well, I had an experience recently, and I've had a few, but one recently that really shocked me. I wasn't necessarily scared. I was just shocked. And it made me think about the state of rage that so many find themselves in and how how easily a feeling turns to rage. So I thought I would tell that story and we would talk a little bit about that feeling and ways we've experienced it and what we do when we experience it. Yeah, I mean, this culture of rage. And when you take a step back, because we're so immersed in it that sometimes you don't even notice it. Mm -hmm. You know, but it's, I mean, it's political debates. It's, (laughs) It's cable news. It's social media. It's, I mean, I'm stating the obvious, but it's music. It's movies. It's TV. It's everything. It's war. It's just this constant rage. And when you brought this up, when you said that you wanted to talk about this today, my first thought was like, you were almost like talking about like, oh, let's talk about gravity or let's talk about the weather. <laughs> like, Because it's so ubiquitous. I mean, yeah. it's a feeling that is unavoidable. We cross it every day in little bits, even if we're not realizing it. So I want to hear your story and also just a little caveat of sorts. So I, when I knew we were going to be talking about rage, I went online and I did a bunch of research. So I'm I, so excited about I don't, it. I don't know if any of it's relevant or interesting, but th- th- luckily there have been a lot of scientific studies done on rage. And so I've done my dilettante research and I will share them with you once we're done with our stories. Okay, that's great. I'm really excited about it. So my story is this. Last week, I was moving, and I live in an apartment on a busy street, or I did. That's where I was moving from. Yeah. And the street parking is... Parking is a challenge, especially on the street. I had a little parking garage, but because I was moving and my apartment was very close to the front, I had to park on the street so that the movers could bring the big pieces in and out Mm -hmm. because they wouldn't have been able to do it any other way. So I borrowed Moby's car because it's bigger than mine so it could hold enough space for the truck to be able to pull up by the front door. And it was four o'clock when they were meant to arrive and they called and said they were there. So I went outside to show them where my car was so that they could pull into it as I was pulling out. And you, you were holding a space for the moving truck. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Super I, but that car, normal. the car had been there for, I don't know, five or six hours at that point because mm-hmm. I was so worried that they wouldn't be able to find a spot. So they finally get there and I show them where I show them where I am, like waving, you know, and point to the spot. And then I go, I'm turning to go get in my car and there was a car parked in a non-spot. There was like a end of a driveway. There was mm-hmm. a guy sitting there, which happens sometimes. It's a busy street. Sometimes people just sit there, whatever, Lyft drivers or whoever. And um, this guy rolls his window down and goes, what the fuck are you doing? And I said, I'm sorry. <laughs> he said, I said, what the fuck do you think you're doing? And I said, uh, I'm moving. My mo- The moving truck is coming in, so I'm giving them the spot. And he was like, you can't do that. I've been waiting for the spot for 10 minutes. And I said, well, I've been holding the spot for many hours, and that's the only way I can get my stuff in and out unless they park a few blocks away, and that would suck. And he was like, not my problem, bitch. And I was like, what? And he gets up out of his car, and I thought he was going to hit me. He was red, almost purple in the face, having this emotional experience, was yelling so angry because he couldn't get the spot that he'd been waiting for for 10 minutes. I I was really, for a moment, like looking around in case case he came after me mm-hmm. to see if there was anyone else there that I could like call for help or something. I Because I really thought that he was going to lunge for me because he was in the stance. His face was red. He was yelling. It was really scary. He had this deep rage experience. And then eventually I was like, OK, well, this guy's being insane and I'm not going to give him the spot. So then I just told the movers to pull up next to my car and double park because that was the only way to do it. And eventually he goes, oh, so you're not moving? And I was like, no, I'm, I am I, mm-hmm. I, I have to get my furniture out, so no. And then he was yelling profanities and crazy stuff as he like skidded away 
Like if somebody would have been on the other side of that truck, you would have fully hit. It was just very dangerous and very, very scary. And it made me think about this feeling of rage that is so overwhelming and almost intoxicating to act on at times. Like there was almost a kind of bizarre glee in his eyes as he was kind of indulging this feeling of rage on like a random lady on the street at four o'clock on a Wednesday. Like it was just really, really bizarre. And I was scared. I did think he was going to hit me. And for what? So that he had a place to park so he could go to get a coffee? Like (laughs) it was just so, it was just so weird. And so it got me thinking about the kind of general states of rage that people are in. And I'm sure on some level, our species has survived because of rage and anxiety continuing to propel us forward and innovate and whatever it takes to stay alive. But we don't need that anymore. And rage feels like a kind of ancient feeling that's no longer necessarily useful because it doesn't really accomplish anything. Yeah, you're, anyway, getting, you're getting to some of the research that I looked at. And um, Wait, do you have a rage story? Well, I've got my own personal rage stories where I've been enraged by things. And in hindsight, I don't understand what I was so mad about. Mm -hmm. But of course, I've been on the receiving end of rage. All the ones I can think of are also car related. And I was trying, I was like, oh, man, like, it's kind of like you're the band and you come out and open with a Beatles song. And I'm like, oh, yeah, well, I'm the I'm like the warm up act going on afterwards. Like your story is so dynamic. (laughs) My stories are not as good. So basically, okay, I think of one I thought of one and this there's a weird variable to this where I I was making a right turn onto a a road, Beachwood Canyon, and there was some guy making a left turn through a red light. So he's doing something illegal, which, because to say the obvious, you're not allowed to go through a red light and you're not allowed to make a left turn through a red light. Yeah. And I was making a legal right turn on red. And as I saw what he was doing, I honked. Say like, what are you doing? Like, that's very dangerous. (laughs) This, you're about to hit me. He followed me home. (gasps) Yeah. Miles and miles. Like he stayed on my bumper for miles and miles and miles. And as I pulled into my driveway, he pulled alongside me and he came up to my window and started punching my window. And I rolled my window down a little bit with my phone. I was like recording it and I was like, you know, I'm, uh, I, I, I lied. I said, I'm live streaming this. Truth is, I don't know how to live stream. But I <laughs> said like, I'm live streaming this. Like this is being documented. Like people are seeing what you're doing. And he was, and I also had I had a video camera, I had a security camera outside of my house, outside of my driveway. This is when I lived way up at uh, Wolf's Lair. And I pointed to that. I said, so I'm live streaming this, which wasn't true, but I was recording it. And the camera was recording it. And I said, I said to him, if you attack me, you're being documented. You'll go to prison. He was more interested in punching my window and trying to kill me. That was his primary goal to the point where even being go- going to prison was less important to him than trying to kill me because I had honked at him as he was going through a red light. Wow. And it was, but it was that moment where I was like, okay, first I was in my car, so I was relatively safe, even though he's punching the window. And I just thought to myself, I was like, somehow the absurdity of it enabled me to stay calm. Home. I, was, I was like, wow, this is so ridiculous and so absurd. He's so attached to his anger. And I asked him, I said, I said, why are you so angry? Like, like you went through a red light. Why are you so angry? And that made, I realized if you really want to make people angry, ask them why they're so angry. Yeah. So that's my story, which is a letdown after yours, because like clearly I was not being threatened, but I was just... He was punching your window. Punching my window. And the fact, like if I'd gotten out of my car, he would have done everything in his power to physically attack me. Yeah. And he was big, like, you know, like clearly bigger than me, stronger than me, he probably would have really hurt me had I gotten out of my car. And it sort of goes to the research that I did of like how rage hijacks the brain. Are, do you think that now would be a good time to pull out some of your dilettantish research? If you'd like me to, sure. No, I'd really do because, okay. you know, because I, I have also experienced feelings of rage and I know that feeling of this adrenaline pumping, overwhelming. It's like it's like a drug. So, yeah, I'm interested in it. So I have as someone who's fascinated with neurochemistry. I'm really fascinated with neural architecture, with the architecture of the brain and how certain parts of the brain 
like certain systems are activated, oftentimes hijacking other systems. And rage, to your earlier point, like it's what kept our ancestors alive, probably. Mm -hmm. If you were being attacked, rage was your defense, like going back hundreds of thousands, millions of years, like a creature, as we've seen with like whether it's cats or wasps or birds or dogs or whomever, like rage is universal. It seems like every creature is capable of rage. Mm -hmm. And obviously there was a good survival benefit when it meant the difference between being killed and not killed. So regarding the neurochemistry, um, I was looking at one research paper and they found that when a brain is experiencing anger, blood is aggressively redirected away from the rational parts of the brain. Yeah. And I think it was like the more ancient parts of the brain. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just reading what was written here. But it, so it takes blood away from the left limbic region, the basal ganglia, the frontal lobe and the parietal lobe. I would really sound smart if I knew how to pronounce parietal. I think it's parietal. Really? Okay. Yes, and I learned this from watching CSI. Okay, so the that one, the parietal lobe. <laughs> so it takes blood away from those. And I know that I'd like the frontal lobe is the seat of reason, mm -hmm. the prefrontal cortex. Um, I believe it's kind of in your forehead where your third eye would be. And isn't fully formed until you're 25. Did you know that? Really? I did not know that. Yeah. That's interesting. And I know that it can be like the growth of it can be inhibited by like toxins and all mm -hmm. cigarette smoke, all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. uh, Sugary cereals. Actually, I don't know if that's true. I'm just trying to figure out a reason I'm so dumb. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then it takes blood to the more sort of primal parts of the brain, like the amygdala, which is the mm. seat of fear and anxiety, is lit up like crazy when the brain is experiencing rage. Mm -hmm. This is just my research. If there's a neurochemist out there who says I'm wrong, by all means tell me that I'm wrong. But it makes so much sense mm -hmm. that basically... Like, so when you were experiencing that, when that when that guy was ready to attack you over a parking spot at 4 p.m. on a Wednesday on, in sunny Los Angeles, or when this guy was ready to go to prison and just so he could express his rage to me, it's like, yeah, their seat of reason has been shut down. Mm -hmm. Like, they're, they're not rational. Or like when we're experiencing rage, we're not rational. Then this is why I was so excited and fascinated to talk about this is the absurdity of rage in this culture. Because mm -hmm. if you take a step back and look at it, it only rage is a harmful experience. Like it hurts the body. Like it, the person is experiencing it. Like it. it it's it, a stress. It stresses yeah. the body out. And yes, I understand. Like there's so many things I'm rageful about. There's so many political things I have rage about. There's so many wrongs happening in this world that I feel rage about. But my rage doesn't make it better. The only thing that would make it better is the rational part of my brain actually doing something about it. But it's really hard to do when I'm in my rage place, you know? Well, that's, yeah. And I, I wanted in a very helpful, ho hopefully helpful way for us to talk about how to address rage. Like what are mm -hmm. some healthy ways for us to deal with it when, or someone listening to deal with it when they experience rage? Mm -hmm. or just intense anger. And what I, again, in my research, but also in my experience, is our brains, and I think I've talked about this before, but this is something that fascinates me so much. Our brain, it's so complicated, this phenomenally intricate computer, but it has no direct experience of the world. Everything the brain thinks, everything the brain feels, it's a result of chemicals. Yeah. It's from adrenaline. It's from dopamine. It's from serotonin. It's from, you know, all these impulses being fed to the brain. And the brain has had three and a half billion years to figure out appropriate responses. And for most of those three and a half billion years, the brain responded rationally. Mm. Like when the brain was flooded with catecholamines, that's what causes rage. That, it's like the adrenaline. That's uh, the chemical that causes it? The class of chemical, yeah. Okay. It's in the fun word, catecholamine. Cat, cat, I, I'm just proud of myself because I couldn't say per, 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 per real. Her? Parietal. Parietal. But I can say catecholamine, except I'm probably pronouncing it wrong too. But I, it <laughs> just sounds nice, catecholamines. So the brain is flooded with these chemicals. And for three and a half billion years, it was right. Basically meaning if it was flooded with those chemicals, it meant there was a threat. There was a, a threat to everything. And you had to respond immediately and accordingly. But now the brain is flooded in what's the word I'm going to say? 
Catecholamines. Yeah, the brain is flooded in catecholamines when someone takes your park or so when someone has a parking space you want or yeah. when someone bumps you in a nightclub or when we read something on social media. And the brain is like, okay, this mechanism has served us so well for three and a half billion years. How could it be wrong? But now it's always wrong. Mm -hmm. Unless you're walking down an alley and someone tries to stab you, you know, then the catecholamines Holamine response would be correct. Yeah. But that's point oh 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 one percent of the time. And the truth is, if something was a true physical threat, I don't think I'd respond with rage. I'd respond with either like fight or flight. You know, like if a bear attacked me, I wouldn't be mad at the bear. I wouldn't scream at the bear. I'd be like scared. I would be pretty mad at the bear. <laughs> so that's what really fascinates me is that like the consequences, it's war, it's rape, it's violence. It's I mean, how the hospitals are just filled with road rage incidents with every everything is rage and it's always wrong. It's fascinating, but also everyone has their survival mechanisms. They just want to survive. And when I think about this guy who I thought was going to hit me because of a parking spot, I was like, I wonder what happened to him today. I wonder if maybe he was going to meet a potential business partner for a deal that might get him enough money so that he could pay his rent the next month. Or if he was going to meet with his ex-wife who he's been paying way too much or not enough child support to, or you know what I mean? Like he was having some survival situation. So here's but the thing. But then I became the one that he projected all of that onto, whatever okay. it was. So I appreciate that you're being, you're willing to even extend a little bit of sort of understanding and kindness to him, but well, I'm not. It's not kindness. I no, think kindness and understanding aren't necessarily the same thing. I think he's an asshole, and I yeah. called him a dick twice. Yeah. Um. <laughs> but here's here's the thing that I will, and I really appreciate you're trying to, you know, we'll say like understand or qualify his anger, but. Even so, it doesn't excuse it, but more likely, nothing happened. Yeah. More likely, and this is what is also so interesting that we're not even aware of, is our ancestors, they spent a lot of time being bored. They spent a lot of time sitting and doing nothing. And as a result, their parasympathetic nervous system was pretty dominant. So if they were angry, it was for a good reason. If they were anxious, it was for a good reason. If they were afraid, it was for a good reason. But the majority of the time, they sat there looking at some trees or they sat there looking at a field or they just is like a lot of sitting and resting. Mm -hmm. So the guy who tried to attack you on the street is probably just a normal person where he woke up after a bad night's sleep, possibly medicated, immediately grabbed his phone and started like looking at information that like made him angry off the bat or like upset or, or even or at the very least stimulated, you know, in a way that he felt like overwhelmed. And then for breakfast had some food that didn't nourish him and maybe some coffee and some sugar that also excited in a bad way his adrenal system creating catecholamines and then gets into his car and is thinking about like all the things that are wrong. He hates his job. You know, he feels unhappy. Then he gets to work and he's disrespected at work and he doesn't feel like he has control and he's worrying about money stuff. And then he goes to lunch and he eats food that makes him even more agitated. Like he has like a hamburger and a milkshake. So by the time he's reached you, he's just in a state of constant agitation, mm -hmm. but nothing's happened. Um, I saw an acupuncturist a few years ago who practiced like traditional medicine. Uh, he was a vegan, so he wasn't using like deer hooves and stuff. But he was talking about this, about how not just Western culture, but human culture at this point is a state of constant agitation. And it's not how we're designed. Mm -hmm. You know, we're designed to rest a lot. We're designed mm -hmm. to sleep a lot. Like our ancestors, it got dark, they went to sleep. It got light, they woke up. Because you couldn't walk, you couldn't do anything at night back then. Yeah. So we're just, and that agitation manifests as depression when the agitation burns us out. Mm -hmm. It manifests as anxiety and it manifests as rage. I'm so glad that you brought this up because I think it's such a fascinating subject. It's also, and I, I, I noticed it a lot in the pandemic, how many people attacked flight attendants or, mm -hmm. or servers or people working at the grocery store. 
there was a story about a woman who had to duct tape a guy to his seat yeah. because they couldn't get him to calm down because he kept groping and trying to assault the flight attendant. Definitely. And it comes down to the control aspect. Like when this guy wanted your parking space, he was like, how dare you prevent me from controlling my environment? Mm -hmm. And maybe that's why cars, maybe this is self-evident, but maybe that's why cars feature in so much rage. Because for a lot of people, a car is control. And it's mm -hmm. this fascinating paradox where like the car is control in a barely controlled environment. Like you're in your car that you control, but you're in traffic, which is completely out of your control. And so like people are like, I control this, but I don't. So thus road rage, like these I, examples of people shooting each other because they didn't like the way the other person was driving. How do you even wrap your head around that? Yeah, because I think about, you know, being on an airplane, you're obviously incredibly out of control on an airplane. You just got to sit back and let them do their thing. But I also think about politically and people having so much rage at drag queens and trans children that they want to harm them and keep them. You know what I mean? Like, why? Because yeah. you don't understand it because it makes you feel out of control. And that was the, the evil genius of Trump was playing into that, you know, recognizing there are all these like frustrated, angry people. All he had to do was show up and be as angry as they are. And they're like, oh, he's our savior. Because it's the magic formula of you think the world is evolving past where you are. Right. And I'm going to make sure that I show you how much that is true and how angry you should be about it and what to do to prevent becoming irrelevant. Yeah. So then it leads us to my one of my guilty rage rabbit holes is like the world of politics mm -hmm. or animal rights or climate change. And all of these things are terrible. Yeah. You know, like the like the way animals are treated is terrible. The way people treat the environment and the climate is terrible. The way people treat each other is terrible. Our political system is broken and dysfunctional. And so one could argue that rage or anger is a rational response to these things, mm -hmm. except that it's pointless. It's that old expression, what is it? Holding on to anger is like drinking poison to make someone else sick. You've heard that? A hundred percent, yeah. I am so guilty of this, and I know that I know that you are as well. Like, open up your laptop, open up your phone, read the news, and read something about some miscarriage of justice, some mm -hmm. violence, another shooting, and animals being abused, the climate being destroyed, and like the response is that helpless anger. And when I was preparing for today's podcast, I just kept remembering the serenity prayer, except the things I can't control, which seems like so defeatist and giving mm -hmm. up, like to be confronted with injustice and to try and accept it seems so wrong. But what good comes from being angry while we're staring at our phones? Yeah. But then there's also the wisdom to know the difference between yeah. the things you can change and the things that you can't. And that's where it gets a little tricky because, you know, when I read about, I read the story about a woman who left her 16-month-old baby so alone she, yeah, in that. the apartment so she could go on a vacation. And I was like, oh, my God, that makes me so mad. Oh, it's it's so sick and so infuriating. And the baby died mm -hmm. of dehydration. Like, it's just so sad. So I was like, I'm so, so mad. And then I was like, okay, that happened and it's terrible. But what can change? Is there some legislation? You know what I mean? Is there like child protective services should be doing a better deal? Like what, where does attention need to go? Could I do anything? And the answer is, I don't know. I don't yeah. know if I can do anything. Vote for people that are pro-children, but now that's a tricky thing, too. <laughs> yeah, because ostensibly, you know? like, QAnon is pro-children, yeah. even though their saint is Trump, who hung out with Jeffrey Epstein. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I it's that, yeah, it's that really fascinating question, because, like, we can identify some expressions of rage that are clearly wrong. Mm -hmm. Like the guy ready to get in a fight with you or me over traffic stuff, mm -hmm. you know. Um, people willing to like kill each other in a bar because someone bumped into or stepped on your shoes. Right. You know, like there's stuff that's like clearly wrong. But then what if it's righteous rage? You mm -hmm. know, as you mentioned, like like if I read about animals being mistreated, if I mm -hmm. read about, you know, environmentalists who go to McDonald's, I'm like, I get so angry. But that's where I think you have to, it almost enters the realm of like incredibly skillful self-awareness, which I'm hopefully 
trying to develop of like having a reaction, looking at the reaction and then asking yourself, okay, is it within my power to turn this reaction into something effective, something meaningful? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're just pouring gasoline on a tire fire. Yeah. It's also something I've been trying to implement into my life, which is a little bit what you're saying is that these extreme responses, can I look at them as information? Can I be a kind of like non-judgmental observer of the feeling and get the information that I need? Is there is there some part of myself I need to give attention to or heal? Or is there something actionable that I can do? Because clearly I want something to change. So I'm trying to just be more observant of the feelings as as powerful information as opposed mm -hmm. to indulging in the feeling itself. It reminds me of two things. One, my mom was a very angry person, mm. very prone to anger. And I'm, sorry, mom, I don't want to malign poor mom, but like she indulged it. She mm -hmm. loved, like she loved her anger. Yeah, you I know. think a lot of people do. It feels good to act on your angry feelings sometimes. Yeah, I mean, that's the Trump presidency. You'll regret that's, it every time unless yeah. you're a, a psychopath. You know, but, that, yeah. that's almost every movie involves sort of like acting on that impulse of anger mm -hmm. and, you know, vanquishing evil. But then she read a, a study in the 70s, like some hippie had some research paper about how indulging anger was good for you. And, mm. and this was kind of like saying to like Donald Trump, like eating bacon and chocolate cake is good for you. Like she was like, she grabbed onto this. And so mm. if I ever tried to like challenge her anger, she had read this one study that said that she should be angry, that it was, she was supposed to indulge it. And I find that like when you indulge something, it state the obvious can become habitual. And with her, it just became it. She was dominated by it. Yeah. But the idea of strategic anger reminds me of one of my favorite clash lyrics, which is anger can be power if you know how to use it. Mm -hmm. And that ideally, that's what where we would all get to that point is the, as you're describing, like the awareness of the rage response and the ability to step back and say, OK, is this a rational response? You know, and if it is, how do I translate this into effective action? There's this this poster or art piece that you gave me by Shepard Fairey that has these like two cool looking ladies on it. And but on the piece, it says knowledge plus action equals power. Mm -hmm. And I've been looking at it every day since you gave it to me like three years ago or something. And I this conversation makes me think about that because I do think that anger, if used correctly, can give you both the knowledge and the the action. You know what I mm -hmm. mean? It can it can propel you and also give you so much information about things that you think could be better, you know? Mm -hmm. I completely agree. But it it's also like right now we're sitting in a nice comfortable studio. You had a little snack bar. I had a, a cup of tea. Thing. It was so good. I had some lunch earlier. Like I'm fed i slept reasonably well last night like the thing, dogs are just dogs are cuddled snoozing. up um so like it's one of those things we've talked about before it's like so you we become aware of the correct response of the like what tools to use but i wonder how well i'll be able to hold on to this the next time i'm filled with rage over something it's so hard but something that i realized is that you can't do this kind of thinking or this kind of work if you're triggered which is a lot of time times the only time you'll think about yeah. i don't want to feel like this anymore is when you're feeling like that and i think that if you can do the work when you feel fine when you're safe and when you're calm if you can do that kind of like reframing before something happens that's the only time you can really ex exercise that muscle you know and one thing i'll add to that because i agree completely is having a planned almost like emergency response you know like knowing for example we we do it all the time like if you're a performer you practice before you go on stage like you don't say to yourself hey i'll figure it out when i'm on stage like you make sure the songs are written the choreography i don't know i don't know choreography but like basically <laughs> though you should start incorporating choreography into your no. show <laughs> uh or like i guess martial arts like they you you practice in a calm environment before you're or even the military like you the idea is you practice 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 so that when you're confronted with 
the adverse situation, the stressful situation, you're prepared. Mm -hmm. So for me, and I'd love to hear if you have any skills or that you rely on, but for me, one of them is the simplest question that's always available to me. If I'm anxious, if I'm depressed, if I'm filled with rage, whatever, is what's actually going on right now? Mm -hmm. Because that I can always get there. It's not too aspirational. It's like, meaning what's going on? Like, if I'm lying in bed and I'm angry about something, I'm like, okay, what's actually going on? Mm -hmm. You know, where am I? What do I see? What do I like? What does what does my bed feel like? Or if mm -hmm. I'm sitting at my laptop and I'm angry about something, I'm like, okay, I'm at my kitchen table. Mm -hmm. I'm fed. I'm comfortable. I can see trees. Um, you know, this is actually a safe place. And that is my... That's my easily accessible way of diffusing a lot of irrational, unhealthy stuff like rage and anxiety. Mm -hmm. I've noticed in my relationship with my boyfriend, things will start to go a little askew. Mm -hmm. And he'll be like, I just want you to notice that you haven't taken a deep breath in like two minutes. Yeah, And I will take some deep breaths and realize that my my whole body shut down to the point where I was only getting these little tiny shallow breaths. And if I can take a moment to just breathe and kind of trick my body into deep breaths, it starts to kind of have a, a reverse reaction where my body starts to act like I'm calm because I'm taking breaths like I do when I'm calm. Mm -hmm. Because I can't ask myself a question when I'm in one of those feelings or in, in that space. I mean, when I'm in that space, I can't ask myself what's really going on because I don't know. Because I am so out of the room that I can't have that rational conversation with myself quite yet. My first step has to be, can I take enough deep breaths to where I remember that I'm a spirit in a brain, in a body, <laughs> on earth, mm -hmm. in a universe? Like, I just, you know. Yeah, the but, physical thing has to get me back so I can talk to myself. Which is funny because to me, the simple question of like, where am I? What's going on? Is more like the idea of breathing. That seems like too ambitious. If I'm filled <laughs> with rage or whatever, I'm like, OK, slowing down to breathe. If like, again, if it works for you, great. But to me, that's almost like higher level. Well, I can't do the thing that you're saying of I can't get my brain to function that way until I have been able to calm my nervous system down a little bit. Hmm. I would say if it works. Whatever great. works. And you have to yeah. try it out because I've tried the one thing, didn't work, tried a different thing. Oh, that's a little bit helpful. But also I was with someone that was able to kind of like help yeah. me with it. I don't know if I would have come to that on my own. And another thing that's worth mentioning and this is one of the reasons I find this so fascinating. It's horrifying, but fascinating is the mindfulness of like, and I know mindfulness is an overused word, but the mindfulness of like being at my kitchen table, reading something on in the New York Times that fills me with rage and realizing like my brain has just been hijacked by information mm -hmm. while I'm completely ignoring what's actually around me. Like I'm ignoring, we've talked about this before, like I'm ignoring the trees that I can see. I'm ignoring the fact that I've got a belly full of food. I'm ignoring the fact that my, you know, if it's winter, my house is relatively warm. I'm ignoring all these physical things that are real. And my brain is completely comprehensively hijacked by this anxiety, depression, or, or anger. Mm -hmm. And the absurdity of that personally helps me to not indulge it as much. Because mm. once you stop taking it seriously, once you recognize that it's, I'm just talking about my own rage, it's ridiculous. Yeah. And so recognizing how 99.999% of the time rage is ridiculous. I'm speaking of for myself. Like, I don't want to be so presumptuous as to say your rage or other people's rage. But when I look at it, it's based on a conditioned response. It's not based on reality. Yeah, especially when the rational response would be, hey, that doesn't work for me. Can I find a situation that does? Can I fix this in a way that does work for me? Like if that guy would have calmly said to me, hey, I really need a spot. Mm -hmm. I'm something urgent is happening and I don't know what to do. It would have been a whole different situation. You know what I mean? You're absolutely right. So one, his actions were completely counterproductive. Mm -hmm. Two, he ran the risk of going to jail, getting in serious trouble, like if he had hit someone or if he had hit you. 
And three, his stress response messed up his immune system. You know, not we're not even the spiritual aspect of like bringing all this negativity to the world and like you're a complete stranger and he was ready to get in a fight with you and yell at you. But like the fact that he was hurting himself and yeah. potentially hurting. I mean, how how many people are in prison right now as a result of a rage mistake? Yeah. You know, the person who was in the bar who got in a fight and accidentally killed someone. Mm -hmm. You know, the person who shot their neighbor because the neighbor was playing music too loud or something like it makes it easier to sort of take a step back and be like, oh, this rage response, it really, it only hurts the person who's having it. And and the people who are on the receiving end of it as well. It reminds me a little bit when I was thinking about your guy with the parking space mm -hmm. of there's an old Buddhist story that I've probably shared because I don't have that many stories, um, is that the idea that like a guy is in a canoe and someone swims up to his canoe and knocks it over. And so the guy gets super wet and he's cold and he's muddy and he's so mad at that guy for knocking over his canoe. How dare you knock over my canoe? Same story, except this time it was a log that knocked over the canoe. The guy wouldn't be mad. He ends up the same. He ends up yeah. like muddy and cold and wet. But like in one case, he's furious. In the other, he's just like, oh, it happens. So imagine if instead of you having that parking space, there hadn't been a parking space. Or imagine if there had been like a city worker or like if they'd been chewed up from like a construction. We wouldn't have been mad. Yeah. The exact same end result. He couldn't park there. Okay, so now good. Now we're both enlightened. Um, well, you know, the next time we've transcended <laughs> rage, we've transcended base human impulses, and we are now existing in the plane of angels. And if you dare challenge me, I will mess you up. <laughs> I will punch you on the street at four o'clock on a Wednesday. <laughs> So, Moby, I thought that it might be kind of fun to talk about luxury items. And I say that because I personally love luxury items. I mean, I don't have a lot, but I like them in theory. And I have, you know, I'm like, one day I'll have a marble bathtub. You know what I mean? Stuff like that. I'll go on a cruise to Cancun. Okay, not that, Ugh. but you know, something nice. I'll go on the, I'll go to the a party on the Danube, or if that is a thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love the idea of luxury items, personally. I'm just thinking of other places like that have the ooh sound. You, know, like you could go to Tulum or Cancun Tulum. or the Danube or inner tubing on the Danube. Okay, so yeah, so luxury items. I love them. You are a person that has worked very, very hard in your life for a very long time and are in a place where you could probably spring for some luxury items, and yet you don't. In the, in the seven or eight years that I've known you, I don't think I've seen you buy a new shirt. I think I saw you buy a new pair of shoes and a new pair of pants once. You don't really buy new clothes. You are, you are a minimalist in your design. You are a minimalist in your consumerism. And I guess I just have a question, which is, why are you like that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, wow. I, I, I Okay, so this has been a recurring question that I've been asked by friends for a long time. I mean, it started even when I was living in my abandoned factory in the late 80s. My cousins came to visit me. And I remember my cousin, Ben, who was pretty young at the time. He was like, why do you live here? It's scary. And I was like, oh, I guess he's right. Because I, I mean, I was broke. I was making $2,500 a year, but I could have afforded something more than squatting in an abandoned factory. I could have moved home. I could have lived with my grandmother. I could have lived with some friends. But instead, I chose to live in an abandoned factory with no heat or I didn't have a bathroom. And it was in a crack neighborhood and it was violent. People got murdered there. But I loved it because it felt right. And I, mm -hmm. I don't, so it's very subjective. So when he said that, I was like, oh, objectively, I understand why he would say that. Like, it was a scary neighborhood, a scary, weird old building. I lived in a dirty, weird space, but for some reason I was okay with it. So there's the subjective aspect of it. But then... I guess the other side of it is twofold. And sorry for sorry if I ramble on a little bit too much about this, but one is the role of evidence. And so basically life provides us with evidence. 
or it provides us with ambition and aspiration. Meaning like people look at something and they think to themselves like, wow, if only I could have a private plane, things would be so much better. Or if only I could go on a red carpet thing at the Grammys, things would be so much better. The weird thing is I've experienced all those things. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, they just, they weren't great. Like I've been to the fanciest parties. I've stayed in the nicest hotels. I've been to the fanciest red carpet events. I, and hopefully it doesn't sound like I'm bragging. And one of the things I'm very grateful for is I now have like a solid empirical base that makes it easy to not romanticize these things. So I think that's it's the evidence aspect of it. it it's interesting. A lot of luxury things, a lot of aspirational things are sold on narrative without reality. Or maybe originally they were sold for evidence. Like, for example, a couple hundred years ago, if you wanted to have a full color representation of a cat in your house, you needed to hire a great painter to do it. Mm -hmm. Now you take a picture with your phone. And but yet, and I love painting, but people still people like people think painting still has value, whereas like it had a specific utility two, three, four hundred years ago. That utility is gone. Mm -hmm. Now the only utility of painting is the subjective perspective of the artist and the uniqueness the fact that that one painting is the only version mm -hmm. of that. So there's that aspect of it. Like, for example, a watch. And this, this leads to my hopefully last long-winded rambling explanation of maybe why I don't like luxury stuff. Is a hundred years ago, if you wanted a watch that told great time, you had to get a Swiss watch, you know, and it would be very expensive, like one of those, I don't even know those Swiss, Swiss watch companies, mm -hmm. because that was the, the, the alternative was nothing. The alternative was like a sundial or, or some broken down old watch that you'd have to wind every now and or then. You'd have to go into the town square to check the, you, ask, you know. The, ask the town crier. Yeah. Like, hey, <laughs> town crier, forsooth, what time is <laughs> hast thou? So a Swiss watch had that specific utility. It told the time really well. Now, I don't want to malign the world of expensive watches, but they tell time worse than your phone. Mm -hmm. You know, a cheap Casio tells time better than one of the most expensive watches on the planet. Mm -hmm. But yet people still value those expensive watches. And that leads me to the last part of why I don't like luxury things is, and maybe I've told this story, if so, I apologize. But when I first moved to LA, I was sitting by the pool because my house then had a pool which I'm embarrassed this of. House? No, the, the old one. Uh -huh. And I was sitting by the pool and I was reading some magazine and I just planted a bunch of trees. If I told this story? I don't know. Okay. I tell the same stories over and over again. <laughs> so, okay. So I'm sitting by the pool, reading a magazine, looking at these trees that we've just planted. And there was an ad in the magazine for a very expensive watch, like some gold Super. I don't want to name brand names because just like I don't want to offend Taylor Swift fans, I don't want to offend anyone because I don't need enemies. I don't need more enemies except for McDonald's and Burger King and the Trumps. So it was almost this like cartoonish look at one thing, look at the other. So I was looking at this picture of like a $50,000 watch that was being advertised, I think, in, in The New Yorker. Mm -hmm. And then just past it was a tree that I had just planted. And the tree was $20. And I looked at the watch, $50,000. And I looked at the tree, $20. I looked at the watch, $50,000. And the tree, $20. And all of a sudden I realized like, here's the watch, it's dead. Like it is pointless. Like it tells time worse than my phone and it's heavy and it's literally dead. Well, I don't know about dead because dead implies that it was ever alive, but like it's made out of metal, which is fine, but it's never, it doesn't do anything. You know, it serves no, it has no remarkable purpose as opposed to the tree, which was $20, could be there for the next 150 years, turn tons of carbon dioxide into oxygen. It can bring nutrients into the soil. It can cool the air. It can provide home for insects and birds and pollinators. And I just had this moment of why in the world is the tree like 10,000 times less expensive than a dead watch? So that was a big part of it. I was like, it's the utility of things. Yeah. Wow, I feel like I've rambled on for 500 hours now. But like, <laughs> so it makes it easier to reject it when you've seen it up close, you've seen it firsthand, and you've seen that it simply doesn't work. Yeah. Granted, 
I could occasionally buy a new shirt. But the shirts I ever find, they only have some holes in them. <laughs> like this one doesn't That's got, too got many. some holes up top. Yeah. That said, I still now want to just go party on the Danube. <laughs> Or other places with the ew sound. <laughs> München. München. <laughs> so, Moby, I just need a little bit of fun time clarification. Okay. So you are an unbelievably prolific music creator, which is so cool and so fun to watch. And it's amazing to see these singers come over and you're constantly creating and you are finding new and interesting places to put this music. And sometimes, even though I'm very aware of your work, don't know all of the things that you have going on. And I if, I think if I don't, and I'm with you most days, I, that people listening may not also. So I thought it might be really helpful if you can kind of talk about what you have going on musically right now and what's coming up and just give us a kind of state of affairs of the musical world of Moby. Okay. And I do agree that I'm prolific. Luckily, that doesn't speak to the quality of what I make, but <laughs> I do make a lot of things. And I was talking to someone yesterday like they were sort of asking, like, how, how do you, where do you find the time to make so much stuff? And there's two aspects to that that we've sort of talked about. One is, for me, work is refuge. Mm -hmm. You know, the outside world is threatening and terrifying and confusing and depressing. Working on music, working on creative projects, like for me, that's my, that's my refuge. Mm -hmm. So I don't think of it as an obligation or a duty or a job. To me, it's like going into my studio, working on music is like, it's monastic. It's, it's, mm -hmm. the, it's, I don't even know how to describe it. It's like a, it's like a, because spiritual is such an overused word, but yeah, it's my refuge. And the other aspect is I don't tour. So you think of like most musicians, like they go on tour and like you're giving up years of your life. You're not really creating much or you're not laying down tracks. Yeah. Because all you're doing is just performing, 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 traveling, traveling, and, traveling. Yeah. Just travel and performing, sitting in hotels, watching CNN, sitting in cars, going to a venue. And I'm not, there's nothing wrong with it, but you don't. It sounds you, so fun. You, oh. you hate it, but it sounds so it. fun to me. You definitely, but you don't get much. You're just being shuttled around from place to place. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if you're in a little punk rock band or if you're in Metallica, like you're going from place to place and there's a good chance you're not getting. You're, the only thing that's expected of you on tour is to occasionally talk about yourself to journalists and to stand on stage and play songs, which is great. But at the end of it, you're like, okay, what do I have to show for it? Like I've made maybe made some money, played some nice shows, but I, don't, I haven't written anything new. I haven't done anything. So the fact that I don't tour means I have all this extra time. Mm -hmm. Then also, I don't date. So think of all the time that people spend dating. And I don't do that. So that gives me a lot of extra time. Mm -hmm. And I don't travel for fun. And I barely socialize. And I'm sober. So I have all the time that most people would spend like – and I don't judge them because I used to do all this stuff, but like traveling, dating, socializing, touring, all that time now I have to work on music and creative stuff. Yeah. And it's great. I guess over time I've just learned that staying home and working on music for me is more fulfilling and more satisfying than any of those other things, you know, touring, dating, socializing, etc. So that's where all the extra time comes from. And the fact that like work is my refuge possibly like someone accused me of being a workaholic and i was like I, am i i guess yeah because i i if you said to me like don't work for a month i wouldn't know what to do yeah go hiking look at trees pet bagel maybe occasionally like clean my kitchen <laughs> okay but to your earlier question that i self-involvedly went on a tangent around uh so let's look at a year so we'll start with last december mm -hmm. and we'll go to this current december Okay, last December, I put out an ambient album called Ambient 23. And then I started a record label called Always Centered at Night. And we released a few more Always Centered at Night singles. And then released the punk rock vegan movie. And then released Reprise NYC with Deutsche Grammophon. And now I'm starting another label called Incoate. And that's sort of like an experimental-ish electronic music label. And then we have more Always Centered at Night songs coming up. Here's a biggie that I haven't announced yet, 
so maybe I shouldn't say it, but I'll announce it anyway, is I started this project about 15 years ago called MobyGratis.com that gives free music away to filmmakers, film students, etc. Mm-hmm. So we're doing an expanded version of Moby Gratis that's going to involve ultimately over a thousand free songs. So wow. it's like a thousand free pieces of music that people can use however they want. The only, the only exceptions are you can't use it to promote right-wing politics and you can't use it to promote meat, dairy, or leather. But otherwise, it'll be free for whatever people want to do with it. Then we're putting out the All the Centered at Night album, more new songs on Inchoate, and then hopefully next December, if I can make it good, I'll be putting out an app because I'm building an ambient music app. The only problem is I don't know if it's good, meaning I don't know if it's better than just streaming ambient music. So... (laughs) We're working on that, and if I, if we can make it good, we'll release it, and if not, it will never see the light of day because there's already lots of ambient music to listen to. So that's, I'm sure there's more, but that's December to December. That's a lot. That's a lot of things because all of those things are not just one thing. Like in Always Centered at Night, there's constant work being done on that. And mm-hmm. when does the final album? Is there an album that will come out? Of yeah, the, the, the album is going to come out. I think in November. What is the? So the label is Always Centered at Night. So what will the album? It will be, be all of the tracks that have been released on Always Centered at Night thus far compiled in one place. What will you call the album? Always Centered at Night Volume. One. Does that oh, seem it'll okay? just be by volumes. If that's, I mean, I hadn't really thought about it, but probably. Pro- probably. <laughs> um, no, I just didn't know if, because I'm still learning sometimes if if a label is the name of the, you know what I mean? I just didn't know if there was some sort of difference because if you're under Deutsche Grammophon as a label, you're not going to call the album yeah. Deutsche Grammophon. You might call it Deutsche Grammophon, like whatever volumes if they did that. But yeah, I don't know. I'm just trying to understand. Yeah, I guess it, you're right because in this way, like Always Enter at Night, it's the label, but it's also sort of the artist. Yeah. So it's like always centered at night as the artist track name featuring Moby and Lady Blackbird or Moby and Daniel Ponder or whomever or Serpent with Feet. But it's always centered at night is the label, but it's also a little bit an alter ego, I guess, because I'm I'm also the musician on all the tracks. Mm-hmm. So I guess it's also sort of me. I think it's very cool. That's also something that I love about the way you work and the way you do music is that you aren't necessarily tied to convention. You kind of just do whatever you want to creatively, not in like bratty child way, in a way of like, if you have a creative impulse, you are very good at making it happen to completion, which is a very rare thing, I think. I don't think a lot of people do that. Well, part of it is because the music landscape, the commercial music landscape, is it's geared towards 19-year-old pop stars. Yeah. I'm not criticizing it, but that's just, that's the musical landscape. And I am not a 19-year-old pop star, which makes it easy for me to ignore the sort of like conventional way in which people release music Mm -hmm. because I certainly can't compete with that nor would I want to so it just means like oh okay well I'm not a 19 year old pop star I don't want to be a 19 year old pop star I don't want to release music that way so I'm just going to release music however makes sense like the ambient stuff like the first ambient long ambient record we just gave it away on the Little Pine website when Little Pine existed when the focus is making music and not necessarily trying to monetize it commercially, it creates complete freedom in terms of releasing things. Oh, also, I left out a couple other things. <laughs> so there's um, an Australian producer named Lude who did a song with me and Issy Cross. And that was a surprisingly successful, almost pop drum and bass track. Lude? Like Quaalude? L-U-U-D-E, yeah. Cool. And then I also did a song with uh, Nicola, who's the singer from a French band called Indochine. Oh, yeah, yeah. So there's, there's, yeah, there's a lot. There's been a lot going on. And I understand why no one apart from me would be aware of the majority of it. And don't forget our album about an opera about a rat with corn on its teeth smiling. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, we wrote our song, our (laughs) documented song. Hopefully there'll be more of those. Oh, I will say that, and I don't know if you've said this, is we want to do that, have that approach 
on other podcast episodes where we basically start from scratch and write a song, but we want to do it in other genres. So I'm going to ask the people who are listening, please write in and tell us what genres we should do next, whether it's like country western, whether it's, I would say hip hop, but no one needs to hear that. No so, one needs to hear us do hip hop. <laughs> but it could be like pop music. It could be dance music. It can be a punk rock song. It could be basically just smooth write in. Jazz. Smooth jazz. It can be... Bossa Nova. It can be any genre apart. I, I can't really do a death metal voice. Can you do that? Oh, I can do a death metal voice. You can? Yeah. Uh, but if I do it right, we, what if I hurt my throat? It hurts. You don't want to get nodes. You want to, should I do a death metal? Yeah. Tell me, tell me to do something death metal. And okay, I'll, is it going to scare Bagel? I hope not. Okay, let's let's hear but it. But I'll do it quiet. I'll do quiet death metal. Okay. What am I going to say? Don't throw my baby out the window. Don't throw my baby out the window. Ding, 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 ding. Yeah, no, I like that. I think okay. it's... Okay. Okay. It's also, if I was to ever... Like, if they remake 30 Rock, and if Jack Donaghy and Devin Banks have a deep voice competition, maybe with Batman... I could break out my Batman voice. Linz, my name is Corn Man. My name is Corn Tooth. <laughs> <laughs> my, my name is Corn Tooth. <laughs> <laughs> So thank you guys for listening. Thank you, Lindsay. And thank you, Bagel and Lucy. Before we say goodbye, I wanted to say regarding rage, regarding emotions (laughs) is... One, I would say to to anybody who struggles with these emotions, like one, know that you're not alone. We all struggle with them. But also, if you're really plagued by depression, anxiety, anger, any of these, you know, really potentially destructive emotions, there are lots of resources, you know. And so one, recognize that everybody experiences these, but if you're really, really having a hard time, please look into all of the resources that are out there that are available. Like, for example, Bagel and Lucy wrestling like little crazy people on the floor. Yes, rescue a dog. But also there are amazing 12-step programs for literally everything you can think of. There are therapists that are low cost or sliding scale, but also talking about how you're feeling with someone that you trust can also be incredibly meaningful just to not let those feelings uh, grow in the darkness. And I'm not laughing at anything that you're saying. I'm laughing at the fact that Lucy and Bagel are losing their minds. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you can hear that in the background. I don't even know what they're saying. Thank you so much for listening. We really, really enjoy doing this podcast and connecting with you. We love your emails, especially when they're nice and not death threats. <laughs> um, so please email us your uh, uh, non-death threats or request about genres of songs you want us to do or thoughts on how you were affected or ways that you have dealt with your rage. And also subjects that we haven't discussed, mm-hmm. guests who we shouldn't invite on. Like, like the whole idea with Moby Pod is it can be anything. You it know? can be anything, and we want it to feel um, obviously very authentic to us, to our interests, but also to anyone listening. We want to know what you are into and what you want to hear about. So um, please send it, send it over our way at MobyPod at Moby dot com. And thanks again for being here with us because you make your your uh, your listenership keeps us going, man. Um, thank you so much to Jonathan Nezvadba who edits this and does such an amazing job. And thank you so much to Human Content who gets this podcast out into the airwaves and into your cute little ear holes. Thank you so much. Thank you.